Hello, welcome to the Thursday, August 30th, 2018 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Sevalde, Germany. We got a little bit more detail on these exposed OctoPrint 3D printers. Now, many of them apparently do have cameras attached, so that gives an attacker full access to the camera. Typically, these cameras are used to watch the 3D printing happen. Also, some users then stream the 3D printing process to YouTube. So you may also expose YouTube credentials, for example, on these printers. There is also one potential potential destructive attack that we heard about, about the printers connected via Octoprint, and that's just to overheat the printers and cause a fire. That's highly dependent on the exact printer hardware being used. Some printers have protection circuits that will prevent that from happening. Xavier posted a little bit more about this uh, with screenshots and uh, some sample G-code files and so that can be downloaded via Octoprint. That's probably the most direct and most common way this could be exploited, just stealing intellectual property essentially from these 3D printers. Like I mentioned yesterday, don't expose them. If you want to proactively search your network for any Octoprint connected printers that may exist, then look for open port 5000. That's where the web GUI usually listens on. And Composer is a package manager that's very popular with a PHP it for the most part relies on packages, which is the repository where PHP packages tend to be deposited that Composer then loads. So a very popular repository of packages that sadly was vulnerable to remote code execution. Sadly, the exploitation of this vulnerability was rather simple. In order to submit your package to packages, all you have to do is give it a URL via a simple web interface where packages can find your package that you're trying to upload. It will then reach out to that URL via git, svn, hg, and I think a couple other technologies it will then launch a Git SVN or whatever and add your URL that you provided via the web interface without properly escaping it, which will then lead to the very classic remote code injection vulnerability. They have patched it, so it's all safe now and there appears to be no malicious compromise using this particular flaw. And then we got another open SSH user enumeration issue, just like the one from a couple of weeks ago. This one was found by Qualys by again looking at that patch that originally led them to the first discovery of such an issue in open SSH. Now, don't take this overly serious. It is just a user enumeration. It, yes, helps an attacker to do some brute force attack. Probably the worst advice that I have seen in this uh, particular incident was that users recommended to turn off public key authentication. Now, that's, I think the right answer is only enable strong authentication mechanisms, only enable the mechanisms that you actually use. This latest vulnerability only affects the GSS Auth2 module, which probably is one of the lesser used authentication methods used with Kerberos and such. So yes, you know, people use it, but probably not all that commonly. It is, however, enabled by default in most Linux distributions. And then we got two new flaws in Intel's uh, TPM, the Trusted Platform Module that is used to verify components as the system starts. So when the system starts, a TPM kicks in and double checks that nothing within sort of the boot sequence was altered. Now, the problem here is what happens if the system goes to sleep? And turns out that if the system goes to sleep, then the platform configuration registers that are used by TPM can be altered and with this the TPM boot security can be bypassed. 
This apparently is really a problem with how TPM 2.0 was specified. It does specify that uh, when TPM is going to sleep, that the state is saved to random access memory. And then it can be restored from random access memory later. But it doesn't really specify what happens if the system resumes from sleep and it can't find a saved state. In that case, the PCRs will just reset. And then an arbitrary value could be sent to the PCRs. So that's in a nutshell the first exploit, which does affect the static root of trust for measurements or DRTM system. The second one is really more an implementation flaw and it does affect the dynamic version. That's the DRTM or dynamic root of trust measurement. And it only affects T-boot, which is a popular component of this system, so that needs to be patched. For the first vulnerability, you actually need to patch firmware. Well, and this is it for today, so thanks again for listening, and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.